Hello there and welcome back. At the beginning of this year, I set a goal of reading 100 books and towards the beginning of the year, yeah, I was reading quite a lot. It didn't read anything really in April and May. So that's why there's been a lack of book talk videos on this channel. But in June, definitely picked up speed reading again. And I have to say, I'm really excited. I've read 50 books. 50 books out of the 100 are what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, not all 50 of those books, but taking the first 50 books that I read, I'm going to let you know my top 10 books that I've read so far this year. Now, if you are interested in what I have read so far this year, what those number one to number 50 are in the order that I've read them, I will be listing them in the description box down below, and you can find that right underneath the like button. Coming in at number 10 is the suspense slash thriller book, The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. In The Paris Apartment, the main character of Jess flees England to spend some time slash needs to get away from England. So she's going to spend her time with her brother, Ben, who lives in Paris. Now, Ben is supposed to meet her, I think, if I remember correctly, at the train station, never shows up. She gets some sort of taxi or she somehow gets to the apartment building. Someone lets her in and she discovers after about a day or two that her brother has gone missing. Just trying to figure out what has happened to her brother. So the reason that I put it at number 10 in the list is it was a very enjoyable book, really did keep me guessing, but it didn't really keep me guessing or really hold my attention until about halfway through the book. To be a really outstanding suspense and thriller book, you have to hold my attention from like at least page four. So I was reading it and I kept reading it because there were so many people on Book Talk and BookTube who were like, yes, this is a great book. So I figured if that many people like a book, it has to be, it has to be good right? Like that's the general consensus of everyone else. So that is one of the reasons I kept going. But once this book did hook my attention about halfway through, it was great. Right up into the shocking ending. Now, of course, as always with book talk videos, I would love to hear from you. What have you been reading lately? What do you think I should read next or we should read next as a community? And have you read any of these books? And if so, let me know what did you think of them? Switching tracks completely as far as genres are concerned is my number nine pick, and that is The Librarian of Auschwitz by Antonio Eider. The Librarian of Auschwitz was definitely a much, much heavier subject than The Paris Apartment, or really than like the everything else. Also, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at it now, like literally everything else on this list. It's a piece of historical fiction that follows the real life account of an Auschwitz prisoner, Dita Krauss. And Dita was one of the librarians of Auschwitz. So it was her job to literally carry around books. So according to this book, there were two types of librarians in the concentration camps. There were the people who were like, physically carrying around the very, very illegal books in their pockets, like in their garments and on their body to lend out to people. And then there were also human librarians, like human books who would know a book, know a story really, really well. And they would tell the stories to the prisoners. Dita was one of the people who like actually carried the books with her. This was an outstanding book. I actually first started reading this back in 2020. I started reading this in February of 2020 and I had to stop because this was such a heavy book and everything else that was going on was so heavy. No, <laughs> I just couldn't do it. And I know that things are still going on that are so heavy, but I needed to read a book or let me say, I read this book in the hopes that it would be about somebody who s faced and survived the genocide of their people. And I decided to pick this back up in hopes that it would be that. And it was, it was, but it was also really, really upsetting and sad. <laughs> Sad's a bad word, but you know, I mean, the author didn't shy away from being like super descriptive of what was actually happening to these people. So yes, it was gruesome. Yes, it was depressing, but it was also the reality that these prisoners faced. This is at number nine and it's not higher in the list is because I found it a little confusing at times. And that, and that may be because I listened to it instead of read it. Maybe if I would have actually been sitting there reading the, reading the book, I don't know, maybe my brain would have kept track of things a little better, but the author would switch from like person to person. It was one of the like, 
third person omniscient narrator sort of thing. So telling the different people's stories all in the same voice really were like, yeah, like it, it took me a while. It took me a while, especially towards the beginning of the book to, to really catch on. And especially because this author used, because it was historical fiction, this author used real life people as well as fictitious people just to kind of like fill things in. But the real life people, it was like the author broke the fourth wall, so to speak, and would be like, and this person went on to do blah, 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 or this person died in blah, 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 blah way. And that I just found a little confusing as far as like listening to it. So kind of threw me off and that is the only reason that it is at number nine. Coming in at number eight is The Stolen Book of Evelyn Aubrey by Selena Burdick. This really wasn't the book that I was expecting it to be. It was so much better. I didn't expect it to have such a rich storyline. Part of the book takes place in the late 1890s and part of the book takes place in early 2000s, I want to say, maybe like 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, somewhere around there. It tells the story of Evelyn Aubrey, who is the wife of famous author William Aubrey. So that's one storyline, and then you have the storyline in the early 2000s with Abigail, and she has just discovered who her father is, and that her father has some connection, I, I say some connection, is like the great, 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 great grandson, however many greats, of Evelyn and William. So those two storylines merge when Abigail flies off to England to the Aubrey estate to learn more about her family. And it was just like a really, there was a little mystery to it. There was a little coziness to it. And overall, just a really great book. Coming in at number seven is Born a Crime, which is the memoir by Trevor Noah. If you want to read this book, I highly recommend that you just pay for the audiobook or, you know, you get a free trial from Audible or something like that. It was so good hearing Trevor Noah speak his story. So Trevor was literally born a crime whenever he was born because at that time in South Africa during the apartheid, uh, you could not have relations between the races. And his parents did, they had him. This is Trevor telling his story from childhood all the way up to relatively recently as an adult. I really enjoyed hearing about his life growing, growing up and all he did, all the side hustles he had or just the hustles in general he had to like try to make ends meet. What I really enjoyed was hearing, you could just tell how much love he had for his mother. I picked this up because I thought that it was going to make me laugh because I just like Trevor Noah's comedy, period. If you don't know, Trevor Noah was the host of The Daily Show for many years. He started out as a comedian. He's just, he's a comedian in general. And so I was expecting it to be like, sort of like a laugh per minute sort of thing. And yes, while I did laugh, I cried a little more than I laughed because it was just such a heartwarming and really like heartfelt story that he told. Coming in at number six is The Fortunes of Jaded Women by Carolyn Wynn. This tells the story of a Vietnamese American family who is cursed. So the curse was that every single descendant from that line would be women and that all of the women would be cursed in love until the curse was broken. This was such a great story about breaking generational curses about family and about family dealing with family where there's a lot of tension breaking from generational trauma and healing from generational trauma as I was listening to it I could definitely see like a movie being made it was like the characters the characters were so well written it was like they were jumping to life right in front of my eyes as I was listening coming in at number five is the thriller the unwanted guest by Shari Lepena it takes place in winter in the Catskills, you have an isolated inn, a group of people, a snowstorm that knocks out the power, and a few murders. So this turns into a lock to tell murder mystery sort of book. This was really great. It reminded me as I was reading it of one of my favorite books, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. Up until the end, actually, I was about like two chap two to three chapters away from the end of the book, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is like almost, almost exactly, and then there were none. And then there was a twist at the ending that I was not expecting. And at number four is Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. This is another memoir that I listened to. It's another one that if you want to consume it, if you want to hear the story of Zahner, I definitely recommend that you listen to an audiobook because it is the actual author who is reading things. When I picked this up or whenever I was like, Libby, yes, I'll get this. I don't know why don't know why. 
I thought this was going to be a comedy. I, I have no clue why. I saw it all over the internets, but I didn't, I didn't read anything about it. I thought Michelle Zahner was a comedian. She's a musician, by the way. Uh, but I thought she was a comedian. I thought this was going to be a cry, like a funny thing, like, oh, ha ha ha, I'm crying in this, in this supermarket. No, no, it is not. Be prepared to boohoo cry the entire time you listen and or read this book. It was so good though, so good, so worth it. This book is about loss and this book is about love and finding connections you thought you lost through food and through community. In this book, Zana recalls what her life was like, taking care of her sort of semi-estranged, that's probably a bad word, but there, there was a lot of tension between her and her mother. And her mother is, she got word that her mother was dying of cancer. And so she flew back home to help her father take care of her Korean mother. Part of the book is that, and it's her going into extreme detail about what it was like to take care of her dying mother. And then the other part is her coming to terms with heritage that she feels that she has lost because she is Korean American. Uh, her mother was Korean, father is white American. This is definitely dealing with love and loss, but this book also deals a lot with diaspora. And I definitely think that you should read this book in a like first or second generation immigrant family, or if you are dealing with trying to heal or get closure from the death and or dying of someone who, you know, you've had tension with. If, if that makes sense. I don't know, maybe it's just me personally, but I find that whenever I, while I was listening to that book, I was going through something in real life very similar to it. It's just nice to hear that someone else was having an experience quite similar to mine in that respect. So yeah, that's why I think that if, I mean, anyone I think would enjoy this book, but if you have those two situations going for you, this is definitely something that you should pick up. All right, we're in the top three. Here we go. Number three is Dead in Memories, which is a collection of short stories by Banana Yoshimoto. This book was first published in 2003 in Japan, and the translation is a recent release here in the States. There are five short stories in this collection, and each one follows women who have lost something, they've been hurt, and they're trying to quietly find their way back into their real normal life. The writing, and I know that it's a translation writing. It's a translation of the writing, but the writing was so beautiful. It, it was poetic and song-like. I really enjoyed the stories in general, but I also enjoyed just the way that it was written. All of these stories were about these women who were trying to heal from their past. And by reading their stories, it kind of made me feel, I don't know, like it, it kind of felt like a healing balm over me as well. I know that sounds weird, but that's how I feel. All right, moving on to number two. And I, I struggled with two and a one for the longest time. If I could, if I could give them both first place, I would, but I cannot because one is a, is a little higher than the other by like a smidge. So in a shocking move, to me at least, I mean, probably not to you, but to me at least, in a shocking move, number two is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I know, shocker, by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Shocker, 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 because when I read that, and I think that was the first video of like my January top five, it was number one, and I remember being like, I'm sure it's gonna be number one for the whole year. Okay, dying old Hollywood actress who feels the need to finally share the stories about all of the loves of her life. And she agrees to only give this interview to one person, not well known at all journalist named Monique. And I really liked this book because being quasi historical fiction, I guess, I am like obsessed with old Hollywood. So I know that all of the things that the studios did to the actors and actresses back then, you know, like with the diets and with the Hays codes, making all of these marriages just so like you look good with the studio. And I was living for this 
book because pretty much that's what this all is. Mwah. Chef's kiss, love it, read it. And coming in at number one is The Decagon House Murders by Kuto Ariyatsuji. This is another Japanese book with a cult following over in Japan that was translated uh, relatively recently, quote unquote, uh, for the States. This is part of a series, if I'm not mistaken, and others in the series haven't been translated yet. But I can't wait for them to be translated so I can gobble them all up shove them in my mind. So this is a murder mystery. It's another locked room murder mystery. Follow some university students who are obsessed with all things mystery and they are part of the university's mystery club. So they go to a Decagon house on a deserted island where a year before there was a grisly murder. It sounds like a fun time, right? So I'm sure that you can see where this is going in this the little decagon house where they are the only people on the island bodies start dropping this of course turns into a locked room locked house locked island murder mystery so this actually follows up until the ending it says that it is follows christie's and then there were none and it said that it was like it came forward and said this was inspired by that so it's all like i knew what was well, let me say i didn't know what was going to happen but having read that book i knew what the ending was going to be or so i thought unlike the ending of then there were none there's a few twists at the end of the deck gone house murders which that is actually what bumped it up to number one and i know they're not the same the seven husbands and this they're two totally different genres but this the the decagon house murders had a wow shocking sort of factor and it also helped that i was so obsessed with it i read the entire book in a day and a half i did not put it down that is it. That is my list of the top 10 books that I've read so far this year. In the second half of the year, hopefully I get to read the other 50 books that I want to for that total of 100. But regardless, I will let you know in December, or I guess technically it would be the beginning of January. I'll let you know my top 10 books for the second half of the year. If you did enjoy this video, by the way, and you would like to hang out a little longer, have in the comments down below my book talk video playlist so that you can binge watch after this one. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your day with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you real soon.